Amos Alonzo Stagg is quite the literary figure in football history. He is one of the coaches that innovated the game and made it what it is today. Well, Timothy P. Brown of Football Archaeology tells us about Stagg's last game at the University of Chicago. Tim's got all the details of this great event coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal of positive football history. And welcome to another Tuesday where we visit with footballarchaeology.com's Timothy P. Brown, the, the master historian, who's going to tell us about another one of his great tidbits. Tim, welcome back to the, pig, the Pig Pen. Hey, I'm Darren. Out there. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, have a quiz for you. I'm not, not going to hit you with the dad joke, but I'm going to hit you with the quiz. Okay. What makes this podcast special this particular one this episode this episode what makes it special well probably the guest is uh most people are going to tell us come on <laughs> come on you and i have done 99 podcasts together before this one really is this what the 100th makes this one? one special this is the century mark huh that's right wow that is uh that is quite an accomplishment numero so. ein hundert I'm mixing my German and my Spanish, but um, yeah, this is our hundredth uh, podcast. Now, I think you know I was on your podcast once or two, once or twice before. We mm -hmm. kind of got together on a regular basis, so this is our hundredth when it was you know on a regular basis. So this is the one hundredth Tuesday in a row that uh, that's that we've had. correct. Yes. Wow. So we're gonna we're gonna that's hit the good. the two year mark in two more episodes or four more episodes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see i do the quiz, math, I do a math quiz math you there. <laughs> all right well hey that is quite an accomplishment uh yeah. anything so so thank you for sharing i didn't realize that i knew it was yeah. a whole bunch but uh yeah so i just you know i'm kind of a dork and so i i've numbered uh, just when we started doing them i started numbering them so we just happen this happens to be the one that says 100 before well so. if i would have known that i would have baked a cake or something so i apologize yeah, well, <laughs> I just wanted to kind of surprise you. This, yeah, that, that is parties great. are always the best. Yeah, that sure is. I, I need to have some like fireworks uh, things going off in the background here when we when we go to do the editing on here. So, well, hey, great. I feel great for sharing that. So, you know, this, this well, it's part of this uh, century mark. We're going to talk about somebody that lived almost a century. That's right. And, and then uh, a tidbit that you wrote a little while ago. Uh, called Stag's last game at Chicago. So the grand old man of football had his last game for the Chicago Maroons yeah. on the sideline. So, you know, the background here, this is Mr. Stag right there. Now this isn't at the 100th game, but that's him along the sidelines at, at Chicago. And so, you know, one of the, you know, so one of the things that I, I actually opened that tidbit with was just the thought that, you know, so from my vantage point, football really started in 1876, 19, not, not 1869. And then Camp died in 1925. He was actually at one of the meetings to, you know, one of the rulemaking meetings. So he, Camp saw the first 50 years of college football. And Stagg, who was, I think, three years younger than him, um, and just, you know, maybe a couple of more, it took him a little bit longer to get to Yale as a young man, but so he's a little bit delayed in terms of, you know, cla you know his class from Yale. Um, but nevertheless, uh, he was born before football came about. He was born during, during the civil war. And, you know, he saw football's first 90 some years, <laughs> you know? So, you know, so I mean, two two pretty two central figures. Obviously, you know, if if Camp is the the father of football, Stag's the uncle, right? You know, and so here's two really influential guys in the history of the game, and then uh, Stag lives forty years longer. You know, so he saw. Yeah, I mean, you just think about what he saw after 1925. So you know. 
very much, you know, the, the forward pass coming into play. You saw the, you know, more, you know, a greater acceptance of, of African-American players. He sees, you know, modern transportation allowing teams to travel and, you know, much more intersectional play. Uh, radio, he saw the beginnings of television, you know, so, I mean, there were things that he saw and changes to the game that, you know, Stag or Camp never saw. So anyway, it's just kind of an interesting way to, to think about their times. But so, you know, Stag went to Yale, coached and attended um, Springfield College. So the YMCA school for, you know, for a year or two. And then he gets recruited to the University of Chicago by the pre then president who was a former Yale faculty member who had had him as a student. And uh, so he, he recruits him to become the, the head of athletics. So a faculty position, but, you know, that meant he was the football coach, baseball coach, track coach. Um, you know, so he became a really influential figure, actually, in, you know, football and track for sure, you know, ma major figure. And, but, so he was the coach there from 1892 through 1932 so 40 years the first 40 years of the school you know he's the football coach um and you know had won a national championship or two and you know a bunch of big 10 championships and everything um but as he was you know kind of getting getting on in the years there was a, chicago brought in this new young president who didn't like athletics and especially didn't like football so the guy eventually just you know bled the budget of the athletic department and then he forced uh stag to retire so at, at age 70 which was a university policy so you know he can do that um and so then stag ends up um so you know th it was known before the season started that this is last year so every opponent would like honor him you know because he had been such a central figure and so most of the teams were giving them like a letter sweater from their school or an award blanket, which a lot of schools gave out at the time rather than sweaters and jackets. Michigan was so damn happy to get rid of them that they gave them a silver <laughs> service <laughs> at their game. So, um, but then his last game is uh, they're playing Chicago and they got a new coach by the name of Clarence Spears who I just say that because, you know, he, he stuck, hung around, he coached in a number of places, you know, for 30 years or whatever. Um, he was one of those guys who was a doc, a physician and would coach during the, you know, during the fall. Um, another interesting thing about the game. So last game of the season, the, the referee for the game was Frank Birch, who was the guy that invented the referee signals, you know, for penalties and touchdowns and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, here's another fairly central figure in the game. Um, but, you know, it, it was one of those games where, you know, Wisconsin scores first, uh, they don't convert, then Chicago scores in the second quarter to, to take the lead because they converted. And then uh, Badgers score again before halftime, 12-7 lead. And then... I mean, I'm a Badger fan, but unfortunately for Stag, <laughs> Badgers scored again. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, there was one play in the second half where the Chicago uh, halfback takes off wide open, nobody there to touch him, and he trips over a line or whatever, but he trips and falls. And so so they never score, and they, they end up losing 18-7. to seven. So Stag loses his last game, ends up with the losing record for the season. Um. So he ends up three, four, and one that year, and which left him at 244, 111, and 27 in his career at Chicago. Um, and in the Big Ten, he went 115, 74, and 12, with 30 of those losses coming since his last championship in 24. So he lost a lot of his games in the last 10 years of his you know, coaching. Because they just, again, like I said, they they kind of got bled out and, you know, academics just became the key. Um, so, but the, then what's kind of cool is that he then leaves Chicago, gets hired at the University of Pacific, and 
he coached there for 14 years. He won five conference titles, <laughs> you know. Um, and then once, you know, once that passed, then he goes out, one of his sons was coaching out at Susquehanna in Pennsylvania. So he was, sometimes his son would say, well, he was a coach and officially his son was a coach. So I'm just going to say he assisted there for six years. And then he goes out, he's like 91 or something like that, goes out to retires in California, but it still is the kicking coach for a local junior college, you know? So the guy ended up, you know, with, uh, guy ended up with, what is it? Uh, 60 plus years of coaching football, you know, at the college level. That's amazing. <laughs> you know? Well, and even more, cause I'm not even counting a Springfield year. So, you know, low sixties. So anyway, I'm just unbelievable. You know, guy who was the, uh, you know, on the rules committee, you know, a number of football innovations are credited to him. He was one of the guys, he and the Harvard captain in the same year invented tackling dummies, right? So, <laughs> I mean, just things like, there, there's so many things, flankers, you know, he, he was the guy who really created a, a lot of just core football elements that, you know, we just take for granted today. Yeah, and like, and like you said, he's right there within the first uh you know, not even a decade football's not even a decade old when he starts playing the game so he's probably observing it you know as a youngster but uh yeah amazing just to take that full circle and uh yeah. what, what a brilliant career excellent yeah yeah there's something else and you know obviously playing at, at yale at the time that was you know yale and princeton were the best football teams you know during that during the 1800s you know so um he was right there in the middle of it all and he was quite the, the baseball player too. I think yeah. uh, Major League Baseball sort of wanted him, be, and he decided he was against professional sports, and uh, that's sort of why he went to the coaching career. He was a very yeah. big advocate of of collegiate and amateur sports. So yeah, he was you know he was a religious guy too, mm -hmm. and so you know um, he's an interesting dude. He's a vegetarian, and you know just he's just <laughs> a, you know kind of unconventional in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, unique individual. Hey, if you live well into your nineties and you're still coaching in your nineties and working and still good brain power, maybe we should all get rid of meat then and become vegetarians. Cause yeah, well, you know, the <laughs> other thing that's funny is that he was, um, there's a lot of stories about, there were different times when I forget exactly what it was. He had some health issues you know, from time to time and his wife would take over. And <laughs> so <laughs> You know, like his wife, a lot of times would be at practice. Like if he couldn't be there or something, she'd kind of run things. And she apparently knew knew her share of football, right? And <laughs> and the team was not, uh, you know, it wasn't like a substitute teacher where kids are trying to screw around. Like they knew that she knew what was going on and they weren't going to get away with anything with her. <laughs> or they meet the consequences if nothing else. I, I wonder if Nick Saban's wife was doing that, like when uh, he had to take a day off. Yeah, I, I, I doubt it, but I'm not sure. He, he probably had a few more assistants than that. Yeah, that could be. That could be. <laughs> well, Tim, that is great stuff on uh, a great, uh, you know, innovator and uh, important figure in football history. And God, we really enjoy that you were able to talk about that last game and give us some of the history before and after uh, that game, too. So it uh, comes full circle on there. Uh, but you you have some interesting topics like this all the time on your website. Maybe you could t tell folks how they could uh, engage and, and read your stuff. Yeah. So just go to footballarchaeology.com, um, you know, bookmark it, go there whenever you want. Alternatively, you can, uh, you can subscribe, uh, subscribe for free. You can follow me on Twitter or on threads or on the Substack app and, uh, you know, Read it as you please. All right. He is Timothy P. Brown of footballarchaeology.com. And Tim, we thank you for joining us and this, uh, giving us another glimpse of football history. And we'd love to talk to you again next Tuesday. Very good. We'll do 101 next week. 101. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. All right. We're taking a peek over at the chains and the down marker. It's fourth and long. We're going to have to punt the ball and get on out of here, but we'll have another series tomorrow for your football history headlines, so be sure to tune in. 
we invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleat Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. Pigskindispatch.com is a proud affiliate of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of sports yesteryear.